Welcome, everybody, to episode five of Interrogative. I'm your host, Tim Wall. And on tonight's episode, we're going to talk about use of force and the state of the Canadian police since the COVID-19 pandemic and PSYOP. On tonight's episode, I'm going to bring in three guests that can talk talk about this all day long. There are three ex-police officers here in Canada. All have a plethora of tactical experience, so they're going to be able to provide us with some great information. We're going to also look at deconstructing some video footage of different interactions between citizens and police during both the pandemic and post-pandemic. So without further ado, I'm going to bring these guys in um, and we'll let them introduce themselves. So here we go. Hey, thanks for having me on the show. Hey, hey, nice to see you, Chris. Nice to see you. Hey, Danny, how you doing, brother? I'm good, man. How are you? Excellent. Excellent. So uh, I'm going to let you guys go ahead and introduce yourselves and tell everybody here uh, who you are, what you do. I'm sure people already know uh, everything about you guys already, but it's good to uh, it's good to let some of the new viewers here uh, find out who you are and, and what you're bringing to the table tonight in this conversation. Lead us off, Danny. You go ahead. No, you go ahead, Chris. I, I just uh, I have to talk to a guy outside my window here. I'll be off for like one minute. Yeah, no worries. I'll start us off. So yeah, my name is Chris Vanaboss. Uh, I was hired as a police officer in 2005. I was a police officer up until well, the last year I officially resigned, but the writing was on the wall in December of 2020 when I openly and publicly took a stand against what was going on with COVID and the perpetuation of having us violate our oaths, which I took and held dear. And I couldn't do that in good conscience. So I stood up and another officer that stood up at the same time, I got connected with and we formed an organization, a not-for-profit called Police on Guard. And from there, it was just hit the ground running. Things started to get really heated really quickly with people joining on board and new initiatives being born out of Police on Guard, which was really amazing to see that uh, it wasn't any one person. It was a collective movement of people of like mind that were not okay with what was going on in our political climate, in our country, with our police, with everything. And from there, I just kept going, man. And here I am now on the Interrogative Podcast with one of my uh, my fellow heroes, one of my hey. fellow favorite former officers, rocking the beard and looking sharp, Danny Bulford. Do a little, yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Get that beard going, eh? <laughs> well, All right, Danny. I, I, I never was able to have one when I was at work, really. So. I figured why not and my wife likes it so i'll probably keep it until she wants me to get rid of it <laughs> <laughs> um so i'm danny bulford i was an rcmp officer for 15 years i started my career in uh, the yukon doing general duty patrol style policing worked in whitehorse which is like small city and then small small town mayo which is kind of like the tv show alaska state troopers uh, pretty much identical to what I was doing up there. Then I got transferred to Ottawa in 2013, and I was a full-time sniper on the Ottawa emergency response team. Mostly, most of the time I was doing protective work for the prime minister, whether it was domestically, occasionally, internationally, if he was in a, like a developing country that wasn't, didn't really have a, what we considered a adequate security service. Okay. So that's what I did for the last eight years of my career. I was trying to figure out what I was going to do because I knew mandates were coming down the pipe, which was obviously going to affect my job. Um, I felt like what I was seeing was criminal from our government and I couldn't understand how police officers were doing things like arresting kids playing hockey and moms watching their kids play sports over masks and vaccine passports which to me seemed insane to be like asking people for their papers like we've all learned some basics about history and here we were repeating it um i was really struggling with what i was going to do and then i picked up druthers one day and there's chris vandenbos on the front page 
giving an yeah. interview and I'm like, there's other cops out there who feel this way, you know, besides like a couple of guys that were at my office. And so I joined police on guard. Uh, through them, I learned about Mounties for Freedom. I didn't even know it was a thing until then. So I kind of was, you know, that was my organization. So I figured that was where I would probably focus my attention. I kind of became the public spokesperson when our supervisors and our commanding officers and our union were all either ignoring us or ridiculing us and making us question our own mental health because we were trying to bring our concerns about what was happening. And eventually I spoke out as well. And so I kind of was the public spokesperson for the Mounties for Freedom for a few months. And then I helped support the Freedom Convoy while it was in Ottawa. Spent most of my time. Most of my time there was like triaging incoming information and trying to figure out what was true, what wasn't, what was a risk, what wasn't, and trying to consistently communicate with the police so they knew that we were trying our very best to remain lawful and peaceful so that they didn't think that we were the bad guys that I knew the government and the media would make us out to be. And so that's my story in a nutshell. So here I am. I want to just go live a quiet life and be left alone, but the globalist elites won't let us. So continuing to try and speak out to the best of my ability. And that's my story. There you, there you go. Well, thank you very much for, for being on here tonight. And it's, uh, it's a great honor to have all you guys on the show. And our final guest tonight is Rob Stocky. Rob, you want to go ahead and just introduce yourself? Sure. First of all, can you hear me okay? Yeah, you're, you're, we can hear you loud and clear, brother. Awesome, thanks. Uh, my name is Rob Stocky. I'm a former policeman with the city of Ottawa. I was a sergeant. I served 13 years and uh, loved every minute of it. was very lucky during my career to do lots of pretty much pretty much everything I wanted to do. But you know what they say, the harder they work, the harder you work, the luckier you get. And that was a good part of it. Um, yeah, so that was my that was my policing career. Uh, I worked as a dive dive team officer. I was a motorcycle officer. I was an investigator. I worked in high tech crime. The majority of my uh, stint was in uniform doing emergency response. That's that was home for me. Loved it. And finally ended off as a sergeant before I left. So that was my career. Awesome. Well, thank you, Rob. Thanks for being here. So also the interesting thing here tonight, guys, we're all Christian and uh, we're brothers in Christ. And uh, three of us here have been uh, we're all we're part of the Bikers Church, uh, the Vanier Bikers Church. And uh, I just wanted to uh, to maybe open this up with a little bit of a prayer. And uh, how, how do you guys feel about that? Does anybody want to say a prayer? Sure. I'd love to say a prayer. Yeah. Yeah. Dan, go, Dan, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I saw your hand there, Dan. Go ahead. No, no, no. I was just going to say, go ahead and take my hat off. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Uh, uh, Lord, I want you, I ask you to bless these men who are with us today. I wish you to look after them in our journeys. We have an uphill battle ahead of us. We are doing what is right and doing what is uh, in your, with your word and your blessings and the example that you have set with for us. We are peaceful, we are determined, and we are faithful to your word. And with that, we ask for your blessing. Everyone said, amen. 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 And can I add amen. one more bit to that prayer, if you don't mind? Rob, if you're good with that. Yeah. I prayed it at the steps of Ottawa at the convoy for the Jericho March. I'm going to pray it over our listeners and everyone in every part of this country. God, I pray against the principalities of darkness in high places that are doing evils over this land, that are working through the hands and feet and minds and hearts of those that have turned their souls to darkness. I pray for those that are your light warriors, those that are turning to you for, for wisdom, for strength. And I'm just praying that you will work through those that are yours as your hands and feet. To continue the great harvest we pray against those principalities of darkness for they hold no dominion over you in jesus name amen amen amen, amen brother amen. well thank you very much guys that was uh that was pretty amazing thanks chris thanks rob uh so i guess we all came together here tonight because um i really was thinking for a long time about uh the liability around some of the conduct of the police officers and i really wanted to get a perspective uh from somebody like you guys right here because do police officers hold a personal liability when they knowingly break the law, right? Whether it's violating your charter rights or using excessive force uh, while on duty, how are, how are these folks accountable and what can citizens do? Because I think what we're seeing a lot since COVID-19 is 
a lot of police officers are violating a lot of people's rights. People don't really know what to do. Um, you know, a lot of people, I don't even think have heard of mischief charges and some of these different charges that they're bringing up, um, in relation to exercising your civil right, uh, and protesting. Right. So I guess I'll have each of you answer that. And from your own perspective, but what kind of personal liability would a police officer hold if they are knowingly breaking the law on duty? Who wants to lead it off? <laughs> Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, I mean, uh, in Ontario, I could speak specifically to that. So just from my experience, what I've witnessed, typically what you would do is you would go through the OIPRD, which is the external complaint department for the police based on the interaction you would have. You'd lodge a complaint with them. That would then be investigated. And for those that say, yeah, well, what good does that do? Well, historically, what it would do before we saw an absolute you know, obfuscation of justice and integrity was it would bring the officer to have to respond and then an investigation would proceed and then the chips would fall where they may. And I have seen it throughout my career where officers lose copious amounts of hours from their vacation bank. They get demoted in pay. They have their feet held to the fire because a public complaint typically did result in some level of seriousness being applied because the last thing that they wanted to have happen was a fracturing of the police and community relationship. Now, I don't know what changed, but through COVID, we saw a gross departure from that process where it seemed that none of that mattered. Nobody cared about that relationship anymore. And that has thus then continued from what I've seen to this point. And I can't figure out it, what the motivation there is. You know, I have my suspicions. We all have strong suspicions, WEF, UN globalism, all that stuff. And for sure, that's there. But what I can't figure out is how they got folks to go along with it at you know, supervision, supervision, rank and file positions. Do they have sure. dirt on them? I don't know what's going on. I don't know. I don't know how it ended up that all of a sudden these institutions got completely hijacked and taken over because I've heard stories recently that the OIPRD isn't doing what they used to do. And there isn't that feat being held to the fire scenario. Okay. Well, that, uh, that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, like, do you, do you, I'm going to throw something else out there. Does anybody else have anything? Do you, do you guys want to comment on, on that, on that question before I kind of, I was going to go off in another vein and I probably shouldn't right now. <laughs> well, I can, I can well, comment. I just my, say, go ahead, Dan. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Rob. I can say from a historical perspective, history repeats itself. And in the Gilded Age of the United States, around 1890 to 1910, and around that area, there were a group called the Robber Barons. And these were the extremely wealthy, very, very few, but extremely wealthy um, class. And that was the Vanderbilts, the Rockefellers, et cetera. And what they did at the time is they did pretty much what's happening today. They corrupted institutions through um, lobbying or bribery, whatever you want to call it, starting with politicians. They, they corrupted the media. They owned the media. And a lot, of their, a lot of the truth was not getting out. So what we're facing today actually happened in history. And... There was a group of journalists who put everything on the line called the muckrakers. And these were, they were eventually known as the muckrakers. And they were essentially holding the feet to, holding the robber baron's feet to the fire. And then once the population kind of figured out what's going on, they pressured their politicians and the politicians took action and dismantled the grip that the robber barons had on society. Now, that was in the United States, but with travel, with flight and all that stuff, the world has become a much smaller place. With communications, the world has become a much smaller place. So now we're we're dealing with this issue on a global perspective, which didn't happen in, in 1890 to 1910. So that's kind of what's happening. And if you want to know what if you want to know the motivation of it, there's two real motivations, and they're both evil. The first one is creative destruction. Creative destruction occurs when technology um upsets an established business for example if you one what, at one time owned a company and you sold copper wire and you were rich all of a sudden fiber optics came along and put you out of business because fiber optics was the way to go and that's called creative destruction taxis became uber uh, copper wire became fiber optics and so on so what's happening is these robber barons at one time had the ability to make a lot of money and they didn't have to worry about competition and when competition came along, because they were failing, a new group of robber barons decided, well, we're going to make it hard for people to compete. And this is why you see so many rich people or so many ultra-rich people telling the population how great communism is. 
because if once they're established and they establish some degree of socialism, then the average person can no longer compete against these people. So that's the first, that's the first issue is creative destruction. The second one is absolute abject evil. Because now you're looking at a situation where these ultra rich people, because the world is so big and we outnumber them so greatly, they know that a reduced population is much easier to control than a large population. So in 2010, when you had Bill Gates speak about reducing the population through the use of vaccines, and then Event 201 took place, and all of a sudden, whatever happened in Event 201 actually happened in COVID-19. The tabletop exercise in Event 201 became the blueprint for deploying COVID-19 with all the psychological warfare and all the psyops that was deployed against the population to get them to comply. That's essentially what the world is facing right now. And this is why people need to understand that the only way to deal with this is to reestablish our political uh, institutions by having good people. And I would suggest predominantly Christians because Christians in history have shown that they're the ones who gave us, you know, if they freed the slaves, they're the ones who gave us education. They're the ones who gave us universal health care. They're the, you know, Christians have done so much in history. And then what happens when God no longer becomes a part of history? Then you have evil filling that void. And that's what we're facing today. Does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah. So, I guess, so yes, it does. It does. Um, but I, I think I'd like to know, like, what is like the 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 liability factor in can can oh can, that's okay that's okay that was that was a great that was a great answer it was it, that was leading into my next uh into my next question anyway but i just i think can can we as citizens can you sue a police officer um personally yeah. can they be personally held liable when they knowingly break the law yeah like that's that's like that's a big thing because you know we're going to rely on um, the the conduct board of um, of each police service um, from the federal level, provincial to the regional levels, and these people obviously aren't willing to play ball and do their job anymore. We're, we're seeing that happen more and more, uh, which speaks exactly what you said there, Rob. Um, the way they are corrupted over such a long period of time, and I think it was a very slow roll into what we see happening now. Um, the judiciary is completely controlled by the executive and they're more than willing to uh, put their fist down on or to influence the direct uh, to directly in uh, to directly um, impact and uh, persuade the frontline officers to do the things that they're doing knowingly that they won't be held liable because nobody will prosecute. So if we are as a citizen, we would like to possibly take a police officer to court to sue what can what can we do there? Because can we lay uh, can we lay a charge on our own without a prosecutor? Are there things that we can do to kind of protect ourselves and to still take action and not be so passive in the background? I've done a lot of talking. Someone should yeah, go ahead, Dan. <laughs> From the RCMP side, there's there's a similar process, just like what Chris discussed. It's a, uh, I think. It's the Civilian Commission for Complaints Against the RCMP. I think that's the title of it. I might not have that exactly right, but it's existed for a long time for people to make complaints against RCMP for their conduct. Uh, traditionally, that was like Chris and Rob both mentioned, like tradition historically, an officer who had a criminal uh, civil, uh, sorry, a civilian complaint made against them was under a tremendous amount of stress because there's a good chance that even if he, even if the officer did what they were trained to do, they're probably still going to get some kind of discipline, or at least it's going to cause them a lot of stress because I've seen over and over and over again, good cops doing their job, getting thrown under the bus by their soup, by their services, because it's politically advantageous. However, sure. like what we see with the criminal justice, with the courts, there's an observable double standard. You know, the violent, dangerous offender gets the revolving door and a COVID dissident gets the hammer and sickle. And that is, that's, you know, that's playing out over and over and over again. I think the Emergencies Act uh, decision from Justice Mosley, that's, that was unexpected for me, like, based on the pattern that we've seen over the last few years, like I think that that's, that's an anomaly. And I think probably because he's at the stage in his career where he doesn't care if they try and cancel him, he's not going to leave a legacy of corruption. Mm -hmm. However, 
um, you know, that that might change eventually, possibly with a change in government, we'll see. However, uh, one more thing I'd like to add is, I think you guys can fill in the blank here. It, it's section 25 of the criminal code, right? That deals with excessive police of excessive use of force. So, uh, section 26 I is think. the limit. 20, 25 is your ability to use force. Okay, so 25 is the authority to use force. 26 is if it, it deals with excessive. So, I mean, police officers have been charged with um, excessive use of force, right? I know a guy up on the Yukon who was convicted of an assault and it was super minor. But again, that was what that was pre COVID versus new COVID. I think if you were a civilian who made a complaint against a police officer for something like that right now that wasn't associated to the freedom convoy or uh, freedom protests, you'd probably still have some level of success. However, if you're a known COVID dissident, they're probably just going to toss your complaint aside and not really take it seriously. That's my personal uh, perspective on that right now. But as far as suing, uh, as far as I know, you can you can sue anybody. It's just a matter of do you have the evidence and the and the financial resources to do it. Okay. Okay. So, what is the opinion on this then? So, um, you know what we're what we're seeing is that any police officer who who will take a stand is pretty much attacked. It's a, they're attacked by their own agency um, and they're canceled. And um, I mean, the, the, the case in point, uh, Detective Gross, Helen Gross from uh, Ottawa Police Service. Um, and there's there's so many more. But um, when we when we look at that case, when anybody stands up, uh, they get uh, they get put to, to the flames immediately. They get canceled. Uh, their careers are, are put in jeopardy. Now, on the flip side of that, if do you think, in your opinion, if somebody was successful in um, in suing a police officer uh, and and you know taking some of their personal assets, how many more police officers would be asked to be like, oh, oh, you know what? Like, I'm oh, personally yeah. liable for this now. Am I? Should I think about what I'm doing? Because you know, my my career is one thing, but if they get me on the other side, you know, like they could they could take my home, they could take they could take these personal assets from me. Would it, would it make, in your opinion, would it make an officer think twice about following the uh the authors and uh or you know looking at well these citizens may have some recourse now well 100 percent, because it comes down to case law so the way that it works and has always worked is if a precedent's been set then the next case is going to use that most recent precedent to springboard off of so and and one thing that we should learn from and it's funny to me that officers forget this it's like Clearly, you don't follow the trends. If you go back to the G20 summit in Toronto, we had these black boot, black, <laughs> black block, whatever they want to call themselves, anarchists coming downtown and smashing out storefronts and setting cruisers on fire. And it was pure, unadulterated anarchy. But at the same time, you had then Bill Blair, who I think we've all might have seen him recently involved in some form of corrupt politics, say oh, no. to his officers, I know this because I was working. Quote, and quote, the gloves are off. Go get them. Which basically was a roundabout way of saying to his officers, going in there and kick the crap out of everyone doing what they're doing. And you had vans pulling up unmarked with like four, four cops in it, snatching and grabbing people, pulling them into the vans, thumping the crap out of them, bringing them to the station, arresting them, charging them, and then turning them out on their Form 10s and what have you. Well, what happened was, all of these people sued because you're allowed to use use of force and, and use force with the use of force module as long as it's justifiable force and everything else, as we mentioned, section 25, 26. But when you go above and beyond and then you write in your notebook, the chief said the gloves are off. Do you think that held any weight in court? Because you took an independent oath of office. That oath of office says that you will protect the charter. You will uphold the people's charter rights. You will keep the peace and prevent offenses to the best of your ability, you know, impartially and according to law. Well, guess what? The chief making a roundabout statement of the gloves are off does not usurp your oath, sir or ma'am. So these people, they got held to the fire. They got charged criminally. They got sued. And you would think officers today would have learned that some fancy sock wearing silver spoon fed feckless clown up in parliament saying, do what you got to do is justification. It's not, you stupid idiot. You're the one that's going to be held to the fire. 
You're, yeah. And now it's going to happen because eventually the political paradigm shifts. And now it's going to be each and every one of those people that said, well, I was just following orders as their boots click walking down the sidewalk, that they should have known better. And that's exactly what they're going to say. You ought to have known better. And it's going to happen again. Yeah, yeah. So I remember I was I was there on that G20 as well. And uh, so uh, I was working. So I worked intelligence at that time and I was working with the Aurora. Uh, and I, I don't, do you remember that the Aurora was used for surveillance on Canadian citizens, which probably a lot of Canadian citizens didn't know, but the military, I think it ended up coming out. And I think, I, I don't know if the, if the calf was sued, uh, but I clearly remember uh, when that Aurora was leaving Greenwood, because I was posted to 14 wing at the time. And I remember when that Aurora left Greenwood, uh, I used to say every time we went up, I'm like, we're capturing information uh, and, and we're, we're surveilling individuals while we fly uh, we, wherever we're going, right? Um, and uh, on station is what we would call it. And when uh, time on station, you are collecting and collecting. And what are we doing with that information? And I was told immediately by my commander to shut up and uh, <laughs> don't ask those questions. But I'm like, this is something that people need to know because the range of that camera, you can see, you can see quite a bit. I mean, it's not the best camera, but... Um, what you're doing with that information is the most important part. And I remember Bill Blair was tied into that as well. And I, I made a statement that day as well. I don't think we should be doing this. And well, I was told quickly to shut up or I was going to be, uh, yeah, I was going to be dealt with pretty quick, but that was my career. My career was me speaking up and saying those things. And maybe that's why I didn't go so far in the military, but there we go. Uh, there that's you why have I'm it. not a cop anymore. I don't do, I don't do well at being told to shut up and not say anything. Mm -hmm. Uh, so same here. So I think I think what, what we're looking at here is, you know, the, the system needs to be overhauled. And um, when we look at the judiciary, how entrenched they are um, and, you know, they're, they're not accountable to anybody. Uh, they're appointed by the bureaucrat of the day. And what, do you, do you, now I'm going to ask us another opinion question here. Do you think that if there's a shift in the political structure in Canada, i.e., small PP, um, you know, do you think that the judiciary will swing his way um, being appointed by the, the liberal government? Is there any difference? I know my opinion, I think it's a uniparty. Uh, I think that nothing much will change. And I think that the grip that the judiciary has uh, right now is still going to prop up this corruption in the police forces that we're seeing uh, happen right now. What is your opinion, guys? I, I don't know if I, <clears throat> I don't know if I completely agree with that because in the judiciary, uh, it's a collection of individuals of all sorts of um, walks of life. I mean, obviously they became lawyers before they became judges, but these judges have families. They have families that were affected by COVID. They have uh, family members that uh, were at the protest, and they have seen some of the ugly side of what has happened. So I think a lot of these judges actually do know that a lot of what they what they rule and how they rule will ultimately affect them. Not everyone, of course. There are very um, political judges for sure. But like like uh, Daniel had pointed out, the judge that had ruled in, uh, against Trudeau's uh, Emergencies Act ruled for the convoy, ruled for freedom. And this is a liberal appointed judge. Yes, this is a senior judge with lots of experience. But nonetheless, I, I do believe that uh, the independence of the judiciary is going to be a thorn in the side of of the WEF and of Trudeau trying to take over this country. I think on to balance that, uh, the Supreme Court had recently ruled, I didn't read the whole decision, but I, I read some commentary about it, and they were discussing the, uh, the terminology of woman, a person with a vagina. And what was material about that discussion was that it was never even raised in the case. So now suddenly you have an activist Supreme Court, which is the final stop, um, telegraphing what it is all about. And this is this is a huge concern at this point um, because ultimately cases and case law will be decided at the Supreme Court if it goes that far. And it is in the government's interest with the endless resources that the government has, if the government is a tyrannical government, to take cases to the Supreme Court because it essentially can give the illusion that there is a independent judiciary putting this uh, decision forward for Canadians and that's how the law of the land is going to be. So there, there, there is a double-edged sword there, but your question was about politics and, and, and it is. It's the only way 
to change what is going on is to change, is to be part of the solution, to have good people running for office and fill the void of what is there right now, because there's a lot of um, politicians that aren't there for uh, Canadians. They're there because they view politics as an entrepreneurial pursuit, and that is wrong. And if I can add to that, because everything Rob said is accurate, there is additional things that the people can and should be doing. And it's something that we have not been doing as a collective society for quite a while now. And that is civic engagement. So I remember as a kid, like, this is innocuous. And you know what? Sometimes we're going to be like, that's a stupid thing to fight for. Well, not to the people that were fighting for it at the time. And that was that the LCBOs and beer stores were going to open up on Sundays. They weren't open on Sundays prior to that point. And a lot of people at that time, because we were a God-fearing nation, took the position that, no, Sunday's the, the Lord's day of rest. And we don't think that, you know, selling swill on a Sunday should be, you know, be allowed in Ontario and in Canada and everything. And people fought tooth and nail and they would protest. They lost the fight, but the, the bottom line is, as I remember distinctly, that people would go to their MPs and MPPs and, and they would go to their police stations over issues. They would write letters. They would go letters to the editor. They would get petitions going. They would flood inboxes. They would ring phones off the hook. How many people do that today? And I am of the opinion, and I've said this in my videos and on my posts, that the reason social media might have been created looking at it retrospectively, or it just was an inconvenient byproduct is that social media is used by people to blow off steam and vent without doing a damn thing about anything because people will post their thoughts and their anger and frustrations and foment whatever it is that they're looking to foment that day. But then they don't actually do anything that's engaging. That's civically engaging. That actually moves the needle. Imagine if you will, you take, a municipality that decided to sign on to the most recent UN whatever agenda. And all of a sudden in your community, you go and you engage many people that you know are of like mind to sign a petition. And you say, the only thing we ask of you in signing this petition to oppose this recent signing on with the UN is that each and every one of you attend with me on this date at this time to go to our city council, town council, what have you, so they can see that there are 500 people there saying no. Now, when those people show up to work that day, the city councillors, the mayor, whoever it might be, and they see that there's a show of people willing to take time out of their schedule to say, heck no, that does move the needle. That puts some second thought into their mind more than them showing up and seeing no one to abate them in what they're doing. So I think that's a big part of what's missing too, is we need to get people more civically engaged, less apathy and lethargy, more passion, more engagement, and to do it lawfully because we know that they'll weaponize it if you don't. So do it lawfully, but do it. So what do you think of adding a piece onto that? What do you think about engaging youth in, in civics? Because I know that in school, uh, you know, that is something that is feared by the indoctrination center. They do not want children to learn how the political system operates in that structure. So if we're talking about um, civic responsibility, is it our responsibility as leaders in our communities to uh, engage our youth in uh, civics lessons and to, to teach them about this? Oh yeah, hundred percent. It certainly beats teaching them about cultural Marxism and that they have 9,700 genders, doesn't it? Teach them what their actual you know, civic responsibilities are, what their rights are, what the law says, how to actually impact your communities and start from your communities to work up to your provinces and your country. You know, like I was talking to somebody recently that said that they have a child in school, grade nine, and uh, they were of the understanding that they were going to be doing a, a survey about gender identity. And of the classroom, there was something like, I can't remember what the percentage was. It was something crazy, though. Something to the tune of like 80% or 90% were gender confused. How many people were gender confused when we went to school? I mean, this is a legit question I think needs to be asked. Is this a byproduct of indoctrination and propagation being, you know, fousted upon our kids every day? Rather than teaching them reading, writing, arithmetic, civil, civic engagement, the law, the things that help them be productive in life, we're, we're more, you know, our, our school systems are more keen on teaching them cultural Marxism and wokeism. And again, that is a result of parental lack of civic engagement and taking initiative into looking at the curriculums. Because if we were more vocal there, I think that wouldn't be the case either. I agree 100%. 
Anybody else want to weigh in on that or should we get into some video footage? Because I don't want to keep you guys too long. I think we're going to, we all agreed on, uh, on an hour. And uh, if we can break into some footage and then just get your opinions on, uh, you know, from what you see on the video, how you would have handled that as an officer, and then what the outcome of that situation could be and should be. Does that sound good to everybody? Can I just say one thing? Can sure. I just say one thing quick about like kind yeah. of tagging on to what was said before? So, <clears throat> you know, parents, politicians, cops, lawyers, judges, everybody, people will be more engaged as soon as they feel like it is safe to do so. I truly believe that we have the majority of the population knows that the trend of our society is going in a bad direction, but cancel the power of cancel culture is extremely powerful and people are worried about losing everything they have. They're worried about losing their job and their home and their family and their friends. Like this last couple of years has sucked. You know what I mean? Yep. Like, I mean, I wouldn't change it. I'm, I, I've been more than I've lost, but it's been a struggle. And so I don't blame people necessarily. I, I wish people would be more vocal, but at the same time, public opinion is what guides politics and probably judicial decisions and, you know, senior management of police organizations, you know, they're going to, if they feel the public pressure is going in a certain direction, they're going to shift that way because like it or not, it's a bit of a popularity contest when you're in those political type professions. And so <laughs> as soon as they feel like the public opinion has shifted in favor of that direction, which I think is possible with a new government, then I think you there, not all hope is lost, right? But people have to get engaged and they have to like, said they have to show that we're opposed to the marxist direction that we're going and when politicians come out and say things that you agree with instead of attacking them for taking two years to say it which hey i get the frustration we need to support them because if all you do is attack them because they're late getting to the party then they're just going to ditch your cause that's what i mm -hmm. would say Okay. Okay. It, it kind of leads me into one more point before we get into a video. And I apologize, guys. The report that has come out from the RCMP on the next five years in, in the Canadian government and the threat uh, of the general population or the citizens know what will happen, I guess, when they know that they've been duped and now they can't afford to live and they there will be civil unrest. So I guess the discussion is around civil unrest. Um it, do we do you think in your opinion that this report the way it was released uh and now in the media is a, some sort of a um ploy or a projection to prepare citizens for what's coming or is it a ploy by the rcmp as sort of a, a, a type of cognitive warfare that is being used a propaganda piece what, what are your guys thoughts on that I think pretty much everything that's coming out and is shown in the mains in the legacy media is a psyop. It's propaganda. Pretty much everything, whether it and and even some of, even it's permeating social media. Uh, you know, like Chris said, the ninety eight genders that it's possible to have flat Earth. That's a psyop. People haven't recognized it yet, but a, a lot of this is and to understand why this is being deployed, you have to look at the interview with Igor Bezmenov, who had a one like absolutely perfect line among many but there's one perfect line that he had which explains the psychological warfare that is being deployed upon us and that is with the psychological warfare that's being deployed upon us eventually the person who's subject to the psychological warfare will be unable to determine what is fact and fiction and when that happens resistance becomes ineffective and that is the goal of all these psyops that are being pushed onto us, whether it's climate change or the or the spraying of of chemicals in 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 the air by by jets, chemtrails. Um, it's a it's a uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's a asymmetric attack that's being placed upon us by every angle possible, and it takes it takes a, a lot of mental fortitude to resist that sort of thing. So when the RCP put that out. 
that there are a number of people that are going to be a potential threat because they're going to be poor. I think there's a degree of truth to that. Because what do you take away from someone who has nothing? They have nothing to lose. Exactly. There's, there's true. There's truth to that. But I think on the other hand, I think our, I think our population is being corralled into that because there are thirsty politicians looking for an excuse to deploy force, to lock people down again. I think that's the other side of the coin. So they're creating a situation. They're creating a, a deliberate tinderbox on purpose to be able to, to use their force. That, that's how I read this. Um, that's my opinion. Yeah. Okay. So it's circling back around to the justification of what may be to come and the, and the, the level of force that will be used. And I think it segues. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Danny. I think it's also, uh, it, to me, it kind of seems like another step in a deliberate attempt to prime the police for violence against the people. I think, you know, police in my experience, anyway, police anger has been building over a period of time because of, you know, defund the police movements and police constantly being the punching bag of the government and the media and the politicians. And so over time, when all you get is beat down for trying to do your job and a, a degree of anger and resentment starts to build. And then something like COVID happens, you see some police officers who seem to be happy to take their anger out on people who were like COVID dissidents. And so I think this is another step in the direction of like, oh, by the way, you were also going to have to worry about a higher level of potential violence toward you, the frontline officer, from people who are feeling desperate and will likely revolt. And so I think it's also a method of priming the police for violence against the population. Yeah, I think uh, I think you're right. Unfortunately, um, I think you're 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 absolutely on the money. And as we go through some of these videos, you're going to see um, you're going to see some escalation like through through some of these videos. So I'm I'm going to break into the first video here, and uh, we'll, we'll let you guys break this down. Wrong video. <laughs> Caught on camera, a brawl between staff and a customer without a mask. This video taken by a bystander at a Canadian tire store in Burnaby. And this video on the right side of your screen, shot by that customer in question as he is swarmed by security guards. Good evening. Police are investigating that heated confrontation and the video will play a significant role. As CTV Sinjin Alexander reports, the customer who wouldn't wear a mask could be facing charges. <laughs> Aisle 17 in a busy Canadian tire Monday night. A man was not wearing a mask, was not going to, and was refusing to leave. You're going to take your hands off me now. You are going to remove your hands from my person now. Video shows five staff members trying to subdue the man, one of them holding a pair of handcuffs. By now, Burnaby Mounties were on their way, called because staff members had allegedly been assaulted. The information we got originally and from the statements is that he did, that he did punch some of the uh, staff. Some of the staff? Yes. I do believe it was more than one person um, in an effort to not be uh, escorted out of the store. I can't breathe! I can't breathe! Now at the front of the store, staff and the man are still struggling. Mounties are looking for more footage. What happened before this video was taken and whether this is excessive is part of the investigation. We'll find out. Uh, I can't say whether uh, there was too much force or not enough force or, uh, or the perfect amount of force until we know all the information. No, I will not store. leave your store. But already another video has surfaced, posted on Facebook by a user named Chris Ivany. It appears to have been taken moments earlier. Hey, you're done. Get out of the store. Don't touch me. You don't get to punch us, buddy. I didn't punch you. Get out of the store. The same user posted this, claiming he was kicked out of Metrotown Mall for being loud. Take off your face diapers. They're useless. COVID-19 is a hoax. When Mounties arrived at Canadian Tire, the man was taken into custody. 
Sinjin joins us live from. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it there. Did you guys did that video play for you guys? Yeah. Did okay. So not police. Police were involved at the end of this. However, there were security and other uh, civilians within the store who took it upon themselves uh, to subdue this man and to put their hands on him. And this is this is what we saw from the this is what we saw from the video. So from that, uh, what are your thoughts? You guys can go one at a time. Well, looking at the use of force, I saw uh, passive resistance. I saw active resistance, and I didn't see anything that showed that the subject was assaultive. So uh, passive resistance is when a subject who's about to be arrested doesn't actually do anything, just sits there and doesn't comply. Active resistance is when the subject who is going to be arrested physically tries to move your hands away, doesn't is not assaulting you, but they're actively preventing you from engaging them or controlling them. And those are the two levels of resistance that I saw. I saw nothing to indicate that that gentleman was assaultive. Uh, the other videos, the subsequent videos showing that he was uh, calling out the hoax, that he was being loud in a, in a store, it, that's not really material to the situation. Um, if, there, if the store had a sign that said you have to wear masks in the store and he didn't, then he could be asked to leave because he's breaking the rules. And if he doesn't leave, he can be arrested. Uh, I'm sure that British Columbia has some sort of uh, equivalent to what Ontario has under the Trespass to Property Act, where if you don't, if you're doing something on the property that you're not supposed to be doing and you've been told about it and you refuse to leave, you can be arrested by the occupiers of the property. All right. Yeah, and the, and the, the fence is, and this is where it gets muddy too, because people will say the masks the mandates weren't a law, right? And you're right, they were mandates. But this is where it gets into the finer technicalities of the law. And the law is, as Rob said, in Ontario under the Trespass to Property Act, you have enter when entry prohibited, which is one of the provisions and statutes under the Trespass to Property Act. The other one is fail to leave when directed. Now, this is where it gets muddy because the wearing of a mask and not being able to wear a mask could be justifiable even based on the reopening Ontario Act provisions, which states that if you have an exception to the rule, which wasn't a law, it's a mandate, um, you are exempt from wearing a mask. It's an, sorry, I apologize. Uh, it's an exemption to not wear a mask. So is the person who's the occupier of the property in a position to be able to adequately determine whether or not somebody has a, an adequate exemption to the mask mandate and therefore are accepted are exempt from the wearing a mask in the store. So this is where it gets into the technicalities, right? And it's also the human rights thing. Like, do were they being discriminated against because of a medical condition from wearing a mask and then assaulted by the store staff? The bottom line is, is this whole thing was a big giant dog crap sandwich that the government created unnecessarily based on a mandate that was not backed by any science. And if any would have carefully would have read the messaging on the mask itself and said this mask does not stop the transmission or infection of a virus disease or particular. But again, I digress. None of that matters. The bottom line is you have a guy who, whether he could not or refused to wear a mask, went into an establishment, Canadian Tire to make a purchase and he was in the end assaulted and choked out right because the yep. whole thing whether it was entry enter when entry prohibited or fail to leave and directed regardless of which one of those two it was under the trespass to property act here in ontario or the equivalent in bc um the entirety of the situation was politically manufactured and this guy was choked out Masks did nothing to stop transmission or infection. And this guy, I don't know what the after result is of this. If anybody else does chime in, but I remember watching that the day after it happened, it was posted and being enraged that okay. this happened. Yeah, that would have been my next question. Do you guys remember back when that situation happened and, and how did you feel at that time? So sorry, Danny, go ahead. Well, I, I don't remember seeing that video in particular. But uh, like Chris had mentioned, like there did appear to be a portion of that video where the security staff was had the guy in, in almost like a carotid type mm -hmm. chokehold, which for us as the RCMP on our use of force model, and I think it's probably standard for police, that there has to be a very high threshold net in order to be legally justified 
in using the carotid control. Like for us, it was grievous bodily, like you need to be fearful of grievous bodily harm or death before you render someone unconscious using a carotid control. And so that, that to me right there would be an excessive use of force. I don't know how security officers are trained in BC, but as an RCMP officer, if you did that, you could get in serious trouble. Right. And in any other circumstance in Ontario, the same, Danny, like if I was a cop showing up to a Walmart and we do it all the time, like loss prevention just affected an arrest on a shop mm -hmm. theft and we show up and we see the video. If I had shown up to any, and, and I hope this, the security people that did this are watching because in any security people, if I were the officer showing up to an incident and I saw the video and you put somebody in a rear naked chokehold for any purpose, whether it be TPA, trespass to property act, or even shop theft, I am arresting you for assault. Hands down, yeah. you're the one leaving in handcuffs and I'm putting you before the staff sergeant for putting somebody in a position of a chokehold who did not demonstrate any serious bodily harm threat to you. That's how I'm handling it. But again, we talked earlier about the COVID politics, right? The reason that didn't happen yeah, exactly. in the, the news story is because he dissented against the 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 flavor of the political day. There you go. Yeah. So correct. the comments, the comments by the police officer, the RCMP spokesperson. Um, how did that make you guys feel? Is that pretty standard coming from the uh, the uh, the public relations team? Well, he was essentially saying. We don't have evidence. I mean, that's what he said. Uh, yeah. He said, you know, maybe there, there's more yeah, video going to come forward and uh, maybe we'll have a look then. But he was correct when he said they don't have the evidence. They don't. I mean, at best, they had failed to leave when directed under the Trespass to Property Act or the BC equivalent of that. But that's all they had. And the funny thing is, 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 this, is this is something that happened right at the very beginning. And I think for the most part, when this first when the pandemic was first announced and it, it started, I think a lot of people were 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 willing to comply because this was new. We didn't have any details yet. The psychological operations didn't start yet. I know myself. The you know the first day or two, someone walked the wrong way down the down the aisle at the grocery store, and I was that guy. Hey, what are you doing? Let's work together here. And then by the third day, I was like, when I started hearing the advertising on the radio. This is not right. I know these techniques. I'm, I'm involved in advertising. These are psychological <laughs> operations against the population. Yeah. And then, yeah. and then, you know, it all went downhill from there. Then I saw what was really going on and uh, there was no more compliance for me. I, I stopped wearing masks uh, to do anything. And, and, and I would just basically say I'm exempt and hands with the security guard would throw his hands up and I'd shop without a mask on. And that's how it was going to be for the rest of the, for the rest of the fake uh, pandemic. Yeah. Yeah, I so, just uh, add a comment. I... sorry, I just wanted to say, Danny, it's probably best not to ask me for comments about the RCMP because the best of the RCMP is sitting on this podcast today, there and everybody go. else, like, <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm not, I'm, I'm not gonna argue. <laughs> yeah, um, I would say, uh, you know, I, I understand the guy holding standing his ground and refusing to leave, I do. But when I was encouraging people with, for to like take little steps of non-compliance, I always encourage people to have like have your walk away point. Like at what point are you going to be like, OK, you know what, I'm done. I'll take my business elsewhere because getting into a fight with like four dudes potentially getting hurt or worse, getting thrown in jail isn't going to do you any good. Like your family needs you not in jail. So, you know, push it to a point to make your to like make yourself heard and make your point but have have a have a plan as to when you're going to be like okay you know what i'm done see you later that's what i would encourage people to do right on so i'm going to drop into the next video here and then uh this is of an opp situation and i think this one's pretty uh pretty well known as well I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to this lady right here. Why are you asking her to leave? Okay, this is between her and us, not yourself. Why are you asking her to leave? Okay. Answer. You can go over here. No. So you can you give us a ticket to identify yourself to us right now for <laughs> trespass to property because they asked you not. To this is a public leave. facility that we paid for. They've asked you to leave. Do you have an identification on you? Because you will be arrested under trespass to property at the request of the facility. You don't want to do this in front of your children, right? We are not trespassing. Yes, you are. Okay. Come on, yeah, you, right. you are. Really? Yeah. Hey, you know what? It's not worth it. 
Okay. Stick around. Yeah. 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 that off. Set your hands back. Turn your hands back. Okay. <laughs> Shoulder position. There. Put your hands here. Move last two places. Let's do it. Yep. Okay. Hold on a second. Here's your glasses. Sit on your head. Okay. Do this in your pocket. And I'll grab your phone. Why are you arresting her? This you. With you? Why are you arresting her? Told you. you didn't say why she's under arrest. Right now it's under the Trespass to Property Act. We are within our rights. Why did, why did you arrest her? I've already told you twice. It's not least. trespassing. We are within our rights. We've been asked by the facility manager. Back we are, what's your name? My name is right here on my and what's, what, what, and what's your Badge what's your partner's name? Emota King Carden. Feel free to contact and find out the rules. Okay, I have to... A mandate is not a law. Don't push by. Excuse me. <laughs> I don't know if you heard me booing during the video. Maybe, sorry, I couldn't help it. That oh pisses me off. Sorry, that was a little. Well, that was a little much, right? That was a little it's much. So she it's heartbreaking. Cold. It's absolutely heartbreaking. Yeah, yeah, yeah I agree. That, that was a last straw video for me. I, when I when I saw that video, I was so full of rage. That was when. That was probably the point I decided like, f this. I'm going to do something because there's no way that this is normal or that this is acceptable. If I was an on-duty cop and that call came in, I would have just said, I'm not going. D sorry, I'm not going. I'm not responding to that. I would have beat the shit out of the guy in the locker room. I'm sorry. <laughs> like, honestly, I, I've, I've, I've <laughs> slammed dudes against lockers before yeah. for stuff at, at work, and they know who they are. I've grabbed guys by the lapels and slammed them into lockers for doing stupid stuff to the public. That dude would have been needing to use the dental plan if I was working that day and I saw that. That enrages me. And I I, I, I don't even want to comment further because I'm going to say something that's going to get you banned. So I'm just going to leave it at that. Let Rob chime in. <laughs> no, so look, this is this is what it's about. Like, let's let's let this roll. Let's let this roll. Um, if you be, feel free, feel free to say what you want. Um, but but um, if you don't, that's cool, too. Rob, what do you think? Well, I have to put myself in the position of the officers. And if I handle, if I was uh, dispatched to that call, a lot of the times you don't know what you're going to get when you, until you get there. So I would have got there. I would have saw what it, what, it hap what, what happened. And this is how I would have probably played it out in my mind. First of all, they had paid for the rink. So they had paid for the use of time in that rink. That was their piece of ice, number one. Number two, they weren't hurting anybody. The masks were a mandate they were not a law that was true as well so at this point i would i would tell the facility operator well i think you've you know I, i'm glad you called us but if you see that they're becoming you know a danger to the public if they start assaulting somebody then call us back have a nice day and i would have left simple as that <laughs> because they hadn't done anything wrong um that's that's i mean that's how i would have handled it simple as that i have a quick question because i never did patrol in ontario so but my understanding is in, in the trespass act like yeah the facility manager asks you to leave technically you're supposed to otherwise they can call the police but isn't it usually on the premise of because you're creating some you're causing some kind of a disturbance or creating some kind of a, a safety issue like you're drunk and disorderly picking fights with people you're being loud and swearing like isn't it typically like you have to be doing something in order to justify the facility manager asking you to leave? Of course. They can't they can't just take yeah. their money and then and then say, well, you know what, we just rented randomly say, Oh, you're not welcome. You're not welcome because we rented the ice. I mean that they would not admit this, but let's let's give a scenario where perhaps they rented the ice the ice time to three different parties and two of them they want to go and one can use it and they triple their income. I mean for what purpose are you asking these people to leave? They're acting lawfully, they're not creating a disturbance. The ice is theirs. What's the mm -hmm. issue here? So, like I said, whenever you whenever you deploy force, and even officer presence is a degree of force, but if you're going to ask somebody, that's a degree of force to leave, you have to be justified in doing it. And I don't see the justification in this case. Do you want us to stand by for to wait for something to happen? I mean, it's OPP. Maybe they had the time to do that. I don't know. But uh, 
the, the fact of the matter is, is they, they handled it very, very poorly. Um, you know, even tactical communication, let's say, let's say they, they thought about this and thought, well, you know what, there is a sign there that says you have to wear masks and these people aren't wearing masks and the facility operator wants us to take them out. Tactical communication goes a very long way. And I think those officers did not uh, deploy tactical communication. They didn't, they didn't justify their positions. They didn't appeal to, to reason for what was going on. It was just, it was over the top. It was brutish. It was, it, it failed. It was, it was an example of failure when it came to use of force or discharging policing duties. That's how I see it. Well, and, and to add to that too, Rob, you mentioned about paying for the ice. You mentioned about having reasonable entitlement, essentially in a roundabout way. It is right in the Trespass to Property Act, okay? This is Trespass to Property Act, Section 2, Subsection 2, Color of Right as a Defense. It is a defense to a charge under Subsection 1 in respect of the premises that is land that the person charged reasonably believed that he or she had title to or an interest in the land that entitled him or her to do the act to com uh, complain of. So that's legally's way of saying it is a municipal property that your property taxes pay for out of your coffers. You are there for an engaged activity that you have paid for your child to be involved in. It is not a private establishment. This is not a coffee shop that somebody owns that has a sign saying in order to engage in commerce in this facility, you need to do such and such. Right. Can't be like if it's the 60s, can't come in if you're black, if it's 2020. You can't come in if you're not vaccinated or not wearing a mask. That's discrimination. We've seen examples of it all through history. And that's what the Human Rights Code is in place for. But when it comes to public places that you have a reasonable expectation of entry to, it doesn't apply. Hanley has shown that. Go through case law. That's why I mentioned case law earlier. Case law <laughs> does not apply to facilities or premises that you have the color of right to be at vis-a-vis -vis an ice rink. So those officers, and I hope the statute of limitations is not over because I hope that that mom lawyers up and sues the crap out of the OPP mm -hmm. officers because they deserve to have their nuts in a sling over that. That is disgusting. You see the kids that are going through that nonsense over a mask. You're an idiot. Both of you officers, you're idiots. You deserve to be deep badged. Well, one more question in terms if of... I can, <laughs> if I can jump in for one second because I think this is a really good uh, part, uh, time to say this. There's a, there's a colleague of mine, and a lot, so a lot of you know who she is, or you will find out who she is if you don't know, but she has a really, really good uh, method of dealing with this stuff right now. One of the issues that we're having, which we talked about at the very beginning, is that police are not laying the charges or not disciplining officers for breaching uh, their duties. That, that is not happening. And what she's doing, and, and there's historical um, precedence to this, is she's asking people, don't get upset make your notes, make very detailed notes of what's going on. When the political winds change, then will be the time mm -hmm. to hold these people accountable. And the thing is, this happened, I mean, if you think about it, if you think about, there's a very small amount of people right now that are causing us grief. It's the politicians in charge, some of the police officers, but for the most part, that's pretty much it. In World War II, you had so many Nazis, you had so many SS, you had so many brutal murderers and so many of them were held to account because people did make notes. It didn't happen overnight. The courts did take action and people were hanged. People were shot. People were stripped of their pensions, their ability to take part in government, the denazification of Germany, the denazification of Europe, actually. These are many of the, of the uh, consequences that a lot of these people had faced, a lot of these monsters had faced. And I think to a degree, if we make notes today, this is one of the ways that people can handle this stuff is make notes, be very detailed, date, time, uh, the context of what was happening, the name of the officer, your interactions, save those notes. They will become handy in the future and there will be justice in the future. So just, I just thought it was a good time to kind of point that out. It's great. And that's actually great. That's really, really helpful. Uh, so with regards to a pregnant woman, what is your training around use of force if you're approaching somebody who is uh, expecting? Was that appropriate? How they handled her? Um, should they have been a little bit more gentle? Should they e even put her in cuffs as she was pregnant? Should they put her in the back of that vehicle? What, what are your opinions on that? And what is the law around that? They cuffed her to the, to the back, right? Hope, yeah. Do they cuff her to the yeah. back or do they put her in the car? I, don't, I, I can't remember, sorry. I, I believe it was to the back. Like, I think it was to the back. 
So putting cuffs on a pregnant woman, how do you feel about that? What is the policy around that? How do you approach somebody who is expecting? Go ahead, well, Dan. I, 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 go ahead, Dan. Well, I think like in this specific scenario, I think it's ridiculous that they even attended the call and entertained it. But if you were in a situation where there was a legitimate arrest to be made and the suspect was a pregnant woman, I don't recall having any specific training. I think it would have been just like common sense applies. You're not going to fire her on the ground with her pregnant belly. You know what I mean? Um, okay. That's about as much as I can say. I don't think there's any specific law around it that I'm aware of, but I could be wrong. I, I don't remember any specific training. It's just, you know, you, you have to make a decision based on the totality totality of the situation and one of the main factors would be the the fact that she's a pregnant woman so that's obviously going to alter how you deal with her and what level of force you use i'm so smiling because when i was in the when i was a supervisor i had mentioned that one of my officers was pregnant and my supervisor my staff sergeant said to me no 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 rob we say in the motherly way <laughs> oh wow <laughs> in Cape Breton, we say in Cape Breton, we say up the stump. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, and, and, yeah. and another another consideration is that we have to maintain um, preserving life, right? That is part of our considerations as officers is to to preserve life. Now, I know in Trudeau's government, babies they're not human, so therefore, I'm sure it wouldn't really matter what you did to a pregnant mother because, heck, why not just offer everybody made? But anyway. Mm -hmm. um, what we were always encouraged to do, and it wasn't a part of our training, but it was highly recommended and even suggested at the police college, was to, if they're not being assaultive and combative, to cuff them to the front. And the reason why you cuff them to the front is because accidents do happen. People do trip, people do fall. And the mother then, as an instinct, would be able to put her hands out to protect her baby from the fall. Now, that's okay. not in any sort of curriculum-based training, I don't think, but I remember that sticking out to me because I did at one point have to arrest a pregnant woman who mm. was pregnant and heavily drunk. And it was a tragic situation because this was the third child that she had done this to causing fetal alcohol syndrome. Wow. But again, my objective in that moment was to do everything I could to not further harm the pregnancy. So I cuffed her to the front, even though she was being combative and she was kicking and spitting and scratching. And mm -hmm. if I could handle a woman in that state of drunkenness, acting like that wily you know, woman was that mm -hmm. night, surely they could have done the same with a woman who was not breaking any laws and not being combative. Again, cowards shouldn't be cops. I'll just Perfect. Say. And there's two of them, right. two yeah, officers there too, yeah. to deal with a yeah. petite woman. Yeah, that that was a little that was that was crazy. I'm gonna bust into the next video. I'm not gonna. I don't want to keep you guys too much longer. Uh, if you do want to stick around, that will be great. Uh, the next video is also OPP, uh, and this video was also very popular. All right, OPP, do you do you see what happened in the video? Did you everybody catch it? Did they push him off the skateboard? Is that what he happened off there? The scooter, off the scooter. He was scooting through a park that you weren't allowed to play in the park at the beginning of COVID. And he was 12 years old and him and his buddies were, were rolling through and the cop told him to stop. He didn't stop and uh then he pushed him. Pushed him off the <laughs> 
so police on guard put a statement out on this when it happened in real time and we reached out to the family and this is where i'm very grateful for the level-headed folks that i surround myself with because my response was not as well-worded and, and amicable and everything else that police on guards response was when i saw that i was so freaking enraged like here you got king kong bundy with a badge throwing this small child 12 years old to the ground because he's outside up like during a lockdown needing fresh air not putting anyone in harm on a scooter and he threw him to the ground like i don't know if you can play it again tj to to show it like because it's pretty small to yeah, see I'll bring it up again here yeah let's show it again Failing to identify in his behavior is unacceptable. So I, 12 year old, do you need to identify 12 year? You don't even have an identification. I believe most 12 year olds, you probably wouldn't get one until you're about 15 or 16 and around your license age, you can, you can get one uh, social insurance number. Maybe he had one of those most likely not going to know that or remember that. And plus you wouldn't give that to a police officer anyway. So failure to identify uh, was the justification and uh and not speaking nicely to him i think he ends up saying later on in the in the video as well you shouldn't talk to an adult that way um clearly that man has definitely some issues he he might even beat his children at home i'd be safe to say he's probably quite violent in the ho in the household um but do, do you justify how do you justify putting your hands on a minor um because i know there would it, again totality of the situation there'd be different situations but in this one particularly here like how excessive was that? Did he need to do that? Um, do you think he was questioning himself afterwards? Like, uh oh, what did I do? I'm on video. Now I got to try to make up a story of why I'm justified in doing that. Let's, let's talk about it a little bit. You know, this kind of uh, reminds me of the David Milgram experiments with the uh, the fake co the students that posed as cops and the students that also posed as convicts and the excessive force that was encouraged to be used. And I think that there was a degree of that in this case. The officer clearly used unnecessary force. Um, there was no reason for that. The kid was in a park. <laughs> he wasn't hurting anybody. He wasn't doing anything. He was out for fresh air. And the funny thing, though, is this tells a a larger picture. Uh, I'm going to pull the I'm going to pull aside for a second. If you look at what happened during the pandemic, you could not buy uh, food without a mask on, except you could buy liquor without a mask on and nobody would challenge you there. You could go to Walmart, you can go to Costco, but you couldn't go to church. You couldn't go to the gym. You couldn't do anything that was essentially healthy. You could stay home and drink. You could smoke your pot, but you couldn't exercise. And I think seeing these police officers, I'm not sure why they didn't clue into that because I sure as heck did right at the very beginning. And clearly they are acting uh, outside of, the way they should be acting they're using excessive force there the officer is losing his 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 uh i don't want to swear he's losing it and it, it just it just looks so so poor and the pro and the, the issue with this in the long term is look how look how long ago this happened this happened a couple of years ago now we're still looking at this now it is still circulating now and it's still creating a really bad taste in people's mouths and if you, and i think one of the really key points to this is if we refer to sir robert peel's principles of policing number three to recognize always that to secure and maintain the respect and approval of the public means also securing of the willing cooperation of the public to the task of securing the observance of laws well these laws exceeded what people were willing to do with how they were willing to behave the restrictions they didn't want them there was they were unnecessary and i think in the in the in the grand scheme of things the way to look at this is the feedback loop. What is happening right now and what is happening with COVID, what has happened and will happen in the future is the feedback loop. Every time these WEF people, they're starting to do this with the 15 minute cities, they're trying to try to implement them. They're seeing how far they can push the public 
before they encounter resistance. And that's the feedback loop. And that's what happened here. Not in this particular small uh, setting, but in terms of how the public in general had reacted to the restrictions and how they were compliant. And I think the funny, what funny thing has happened is now that if you listen to what people are saying, they're not taking a fourth jab. I took the first two or I took the first three. I'm not doing any more. This is ridiculous. I think there's a degree of, of resistance that is happening now because people have learned that this is not right. And I think people have started to stand up, whereas they weren't before because there was such there was such faith and there was such um, belief in our in our in our public safety uh, institutions. And I think a lot of that, especially with the convoy, was so violated that a lot of people are willing to stand up now. They they are not going to be showing uh, uniform officers in in uh, in endless degree of respect that at one time they did because of the way the police act, because of the way the police had violated their covenant with the public. They they didn't show themselves to be the members of the of the public and the public to be the members of the police, vice versa, like Robert Peel's principles point out. They showed themselves to be an elitist jackboot force of government policy, regardless of what the public wanted from their government and what they wanted from their police services. So I think there was a lot of damage that was mm -hmm. done uh, during this time because of the way the police acted. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, the the life. Uh, you know, I know I have a cousin of mine. He's he's an RCMP officer. He's a deck commander in Nova Scotia in Barrington Passage, and um, I remember he told me like you know he he was in the military and then he left military and he he joined the RCMP years years after that and he said it's a it's a lonely life you know like you don't ha like you don't have the same circle of friends you know um and he told me when i was joining the military that would be the same thing uh now it's 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 even more so for a police officer you're really uh it's narrow on who you really can associate with for a multitude of reasons right um and so now you've seen yourself isolated even more by the general public because of the behaviors of some of these officers that we see happening right now and uh i can only imagine that the stress is continually building on these folks whether or not they are morally um, bankrupt or not, I think that it's it's getting increasingly difficult uh, to to go out in public, right? I remember at the start of the pandemic, I said, you know, why are you even letting them into your stores? Like these people live in your community, right? Like I got a guy who lives right behind me. He would go downtown, beat some people up, come home, come over to my house, ask me if I wanted to build a fence together, uh, chip in on it together, me and a couple of other neighbors, a couple other guys who live around me are cop military guys. I live right next to Dwyer Hill, by the way. And uh, so, you know, and then fight me over for a barbecue. Like, nothing's wrong. Like, nothing's wrong. Like, like you know, like, I don't know what's going on here in that man's mind. But clearly, there's, there's, it's not, it's not equating. The math is not mathing with some of these folks. And uh, I can only imagine it's getting terribly worse for, for some of them, right? Uh, even more isolated. And and maybe the mental health is is definitely failing. Um did anybody else want to say anything about that video or can I move right into the next one? The next one is quite interesting. It's, it's, uh, it's a real questionable use of force um, and possibly public endangerment. So I'm going to hop into that. Yeah, man. Give it a go. Yeah. Yeah. You're a fucking asshole. You're a fucking asshole. Yeah. I bet you feel back good. Back up. No, back up. I bet you feel good. Back up. 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 I hope he does, because I'll sue the balls off of him. I will sue the balls off of you. He didn't, this is forceful, man. Man, do you control him? He's just being brutal. He's just being, he has no balls. Don't worry. You, yeah, the boys are you're lucky you didn't tase me, bud. You're so lucky you didn't tase me. Yeah. Big fan on campus. Oh. Huh. Well, that's karma. That's karma. He didn't do anything, man. He didn't do anything, man. He didn't do anything, man. Yeah. He didn't do Hey, guys, come on. Don't touch them. Come on. All right. I will politely go. 
But please don't, please don't get brutal, please. We were peaceful. Come on, they were peaceful. Everybody back up. Everybody back up. Don't hit me. No, don't hit him, sir. Just back up. You back up, sir. Okay, let's save you. He's not allowed to touch you. He's not allowed to touch you, but I don't want you to get hurt, baby. Oh, I'm worried about that. He's going to get hurt. I know. I know. I know. I know. I know. But they don't care. Oh, They'll I don't hurt care you. either. They'll hurt you, babe. Hey, I know. Hey, you fell on your own ass, and then you tried to hit him. I'm not your fucking friend. You know what? He's done enough. I don't know why you're shouting. You don't know why? Get off the roof. Get off the roof. God is watching you! 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 I will pray for your souls. Billy, Billy, don't say a word. Billy, do not say a word. Don't say a word, dear. God is watching you. Don't you worry. God is watching. Your spirits will not be saved. God is watching you. God is watching you. You're not listening to my commands. Fuck you. You're Get off fuck the you. road. You're, You're not just an agent. You're not no commander. You're no fucking commander. You're not commander. Is this dictator shit? He's not on the road. They're not on the road. God is watching you. Yeah, I can't wait to see you in front of God. Hey, and your kids. You must be ashamed of yourself. Shameful. Okay, so I'm going to end it there. Well, who wants to, who, I mean, wants I don't to? know what happened before the first guy got arrested because the video doesn't show that. But what I did see was as they're transporting him, but he falls and gets butt hurt and needs somebody mm. to blame because he can't put one foot in front of the other. So then mm. he starts getting a tacky on the public. It's like, man. I just, I, I scratch my head. Like I do, I scratch my head and I go, really? Have you guys lost all humility? And I just don't understand it. I mean, Rob, God bless him. I love him. He mentioned the appeals principles of policing number three. It's like the, the whole of policing today, with the exception of the rare few with testicular fortitude and nobility, have forgotten that one of the main principles that we were taught is the public are the police and the police are the public. Like, we're supposed to be working together. We're supposed to have this symbiotic relationship where if I'm by myself at three in the morning doing a traffic stop on some gangbangers that just committed a home invasion and backup is still stuck at the station because they were doing paperwork for a domestic and all of a sudden these guys get squirrely and I'm by myself, that the public might have enough respect for what I do at night to keep them safe to help me out. This is what seems to be the lost where are these officers' heads at? Do they think that they are on an island completely by themselves? And this also goes back to the comments made about, you know, the division. Um, Danny said about the, the the police looking for an opportunity to get their licks in because of the hate on police. But you need to be bigger than that, have thicker skin than that, and have a smarter head than that. The people that loved police are losing their love for police if it's not already lost. And that's because of the actions of these jackboot idiots. And it's not all of them, but there is enough of them that has irreparably damaged the relationship between the police and the public and caused so much harm that good God fearing law abiding people that I know don't trust the police. That's a problem. Yeah, I would say uh, I I don't know what that guy was arrested for, why they had him down on the ground to begin with. I think what we saw from the behavior of the officer, especially the one who had the taser out and was giving him like the touch stunt, is like they were afraid 
likely because they're almost surrounded by people who are yelling at them. And I know I've been in a situation like that where, you know, you're stuck in a room fighting with a guy and all of a sudden his family is like trying to barge their way into the room, even though they're the ones who called. And like that definitely elevates your stress level. And so I think they're probably reacting out of a little bit of fear. And so I do have a little bit of sympathy for them in that specific scenario, because I honestly, I can't stand it when I see videos of people like just like getting in their face and yelling and screaming at them. Like that's not going to help the situation. That's just going to escalate and amp things up and it's going to cause potential for greater violence. Um, And I think most of the time what we saw with the convoy was people were the opposite of that. However, I think that that increased anger is because of like what Chris had mentioned, right? Like people who used to maybe support the police no longer trust them. And now everyone's looking for a reason to have like a gotcha moment for the police now. And you know, that the, the videotaping them is no new thing, right? Like that's been happening for quite a while, but there's definitely seems to be a higher level of mistrust and anger. Now, I, I, although I will say, like, to be fair, I do think that the the older police officer in that video was super calm and collected, even though, like, he probably had every reason to be a little bit more aggressive with people getting in his face, but he held it together pretty good. And so that, I think, would should be the baseline, right? Like, part of the reason that you get yelled at in training and kind of beat down a little bit in training is so that you're ready to experience that in the field. And so that guy seemed to handle himself very well. But yeah, the guy who fell and then hopped back up and was looking to like muckle onto someone to blame. Not professional. Same with the guy pushing the little kid off of the scooter. Not professional. Older man who kept his cool. That's what you expect out of a professional police officer. Rob, anything to add? Uh, I agree with the with what uh, Chris and Dan had said. We didn't see what happened in before that, so there's a there's a, a pretty significant piece of the puzzle missing. But I can tell you from living in Ottawa, that obviously was in Ottawa down at Parliament Hill. Ever okay. since um, the crackdown of Trudeau and the Emergencies Act, there has been a group that has been kind of stationary in that area. They they don't do much. They basically hold their signs, and they're embarrassing Trudeau because. They're still there, and they're mm-hmm. not really, like I said, they're they're not a nuisance to the public. They're not accosting anybody. They're not in anybody's face. They're just kind of, you know, holding up their signs about tyranny, and it's really becoming irritating to uh, to the government. And I think the I, I think I mean, if I was to piece together what's happening here, probably somebody for the government complained to somebody in the Ottawa Police and to bylaw because I know they have been uh, cracking down on these people and writing these tickets that are going to yep. go nowhere as a form of intimidation. But these people have the lawful right to to be there. They have the lawful right to protest. They have a lawful right to stand and hold a sign if they want to. There's nothing wrong with that, not in a, demo- mm-hmm. in, in a democracy. And so I, if I was to put that puzzle piece into the picture, uh, aside from what that guy may have done, there these people are, are out there in the cold. They're out there in the rain. They're, they're, they really believe in what they're standing there for, and they're not hurting anybody. And... I think Trudeau's ego is bruised, and that's why this is happening. I think this is political interference yet again, and these tickets that are being written are going to go nowhere. So hats off to them for standing their ground and being peaceful about it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the the gentleman who was on the ground, um, two tasers, was were both both of them were tasing him? Did, did you guys see that, or was it just me? I saw two, one. Two, I didn't see the other one. One taser, it was one taser the, the tap tap? Was that the only taser? I, I, I saw one device is what I'm saying. I only saw one device. I didn't see two devices is what I'm saying. Okay. Okay. Because I thought there was the other officer who was on from the other side was tasing his other side and this guy was tasing. So I thought they were double tasing him. Now I might be wrong. I'm not going to roll the clip again, but what would warrant the taser being deployed? I would think in my, so I, I have no experience in this, but I would think that the man would have to be quite, or the individual will be quite aggressive and there'd be no other way to subdue him. Hands were behind the back. They had their knees on him and they were tasing him anyway. And he didn't look like he was moving or resisting in any way. And to me, the video looked like 
the police were very worried that they were being surrounded, correct? And the only way to neutralize the situation was to pull that out. And I think having him on the ground so he can't move, neutralizing him, and then he even pointed it at the at the public to stay back. So clearly you could see that the police were were nervous about the situation and being surrounded, rightfully so. But what warrants the, the tasing if you're not resisting? And did you see resistance in that man? Let's talk about it. Oh, well, again, I saw passive resistance. I didn't see he wasn't assaultive. And in order to deploy the taser, you have to be assaultive. I mean, that's it's been a while since I've done this, so I'm kind of a little bit out of uh, uh, practice when it comes to the use of force with the taser anyway. Um, but as far as I remember, you have to be assaultive to deploy the taser. And I didn't see any indication that the man was being assaultive. He was just being uh, uh, passively resistant, which doesn't, I, I don't, Chris, I don't know, or Dan, I don't know if you, if you guys have want to ring in on this because it's been a while since I've done that. So, Well, I, I would agree with that. Like when I was brand new, I wasn't carrying a taser because I hadn't been trained yet, but it was kind of, you know, the, the touch stun was a form of like pain compliance to get someone to comply when they were, you know, they weren't giving you their arm or, or they weren't getting in the police car or something like that. But Lost the volume. Sure. Yeah, can't hear him. Oh no, Danny. This happened before. Yeah, he was talking with the high threshold. I saw that there. The hands are going. Say something. Let's see if we can hear you. Oh, Cease has got to us yeah. again. Yeah, there you go. We're watching now. <laughs> they're, they're on. They're on the interrogative. <laughs> Too much public education going on here, I think. Yeah. Well, welcome, welcome to the uh, the umbrella here, there, interrogative oh. and TJ. <laughs> there, you go. there you go. So, uh, well, Danny probably won't be back, but, uh, you know, thank him for coming out and, uh, and, and taking part in this. I want to show one more, uh, one more video. And plus, Chris, do you have anything to say about the use of force with a taser? Uh, in no, that particular I, I think it was summed up succinctly. Okay. All right. So I'm going to play one last video. And uh, this is what I wanted to get into, um, which is going to be a situation. I think, Rob, we've discussed this uh, at the last uh, uh, use of force security training we did. Oh, Danny's back. You, th you there? Hi. I left hey. and tried to come back to see if you could hear me. There you go. Yeah, we can we hear, hear you. We you. We were coming back. Um, so okay, we're, we're okay. Gonna, do you want to finish what you were saying about that, uh, about the use of force with taser? Yeah, it got yeah. elevated to assaultive behavior from the suspect. Um, you know, after YVR, the Vancouver airport incident with, uh, Robert Jagansky, everything yes. changed for the RCMP with the use of the taser after that. Okay. Okay. So would that trickle down to like, you know, is it the same policy for a municipal police force? uh with the use of force it, it deploying that taser i think it's pretty standard might pretty not standard? be exactly the same but okay. i think it's probably pretty standard across canada okay sorry can you repeat the question there uh tj so uh the question was you know what um what threshold do you have to meet uh, to deploy the taser, and do you believe that that threshold was met um, from that gentleman on the ground was he um, was he aggressive or combative and not compliant with the instruction of the officer? Was the officer even giving instruction to him or was the officer worried about who else was around him? Also, can you point that taser at the public like that? Is that, is that a deterrent that you would usually go to or how would, how would you work that if you were in that situation? Well, knowing what I, what I know about how, uh, what I saw, what I, knowing what I know about how downtown is, first of all, those officers are not by themselves in some remote area that they're so close to parliament hill and the parliament hill has their own security staff that could there are peace officers they could certainly come in to resist if there was a situation you saw in the video there was another officer who came in from behind and entered into the foreground of the video so there were more police officers on scene than we initially saw when that video was being shot like i said we don't have that piece of the puzzle what happened beforehand but looking at the use of force wheel right now and tactical considerations, physical control with intermediate weapons occurs during the stage of active resistance. And from what I saw in that video, that that man was being uh, passively resistant, 
where he wasn't actively shoving off the officers. He was just basically non-compliant. He's just basically lying there with all his weight on the ground. So I don't see how the, the, the taser in that case could have been justified. I also, uh, when it came to um, the officer pointing the taser at the public, I can, I mean, he didn't deploy the taser. He pointed it as a warning. I can appreciate how a group of people uh, with, the, with the officers back to those people because he's trying to affect an arrest could escalate into a, uh, a, a not a, a dangerous situation. But in this case, those officers are neighborhood officers in Ottawa. They're very familiar with the people mm -hmm. who are downtown. They know by this point, they have intelligence. These are not violent people. These are not people who, who are going to, who are going to resist. They're not going to try and take your gun. They're not going to try to you know, ambush you from behind. These are, these are passive protesters holding their sign. Once in a while, they'll chant something. Once in a while, they'll sing a song, but that's as far as they go. And they're, they're in annoyance. They're irritating to the prime minister, but that's it. They've been there okay. for a very long time. So I, I don't see the, I don't see why with everything that they know and the experience that they should have with these people that they would have gone to that level of use of force. All right. Perfect. Thank you so much. That, that makes sense. That makes sense. And the political motivation behind all of this seems to be a common theme, right? Um, you know, the, the, the arm of the uh, shrewd little feckless, like you like to say, Chris, uh, you know, nutless, I'll, I'll say, uh, politician is uh, is really guiding the hand here, and and it's guiding that guiding that iron fist. Um, so I'm going to roll into the next video, and I think this will be the last uh, video, and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, it's going to talk about it's going to be related to one section 176 of the criminal code, and I think this is something that, um, uh, like I said, us as Christians uh, and the new uh, Bill C63 coming out, this could possibly be something that happens more regularly than not. Um, where pastors are being arrested and churches are being, um, uh, you know, um, taken over by police and shut down. Um, so how how are we going to deal with this? Is this is this appropriate? Um, they they clearly broke the law. Why is this not standing in a court? Um, let's look at the video and then we'll go from there. Okay, so we're here at the uh, Church of God in Elmer, where police are now moving in to lock the doors. They've got a locksmith, um, they've got officers. They're just staging out by the road. just staging on the uh, highway here outside of the property. always moving through the bushes so for those just joining in police are just moving in with a locksmith to to change the locks on the Church of God building here in Elmer Ontario Thank you. 
police are just moving in to lock the doors here. scripture for you, two verses out of Daniel chapter 3, verse 18, verse 17. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand. But if not, but if not, be it known unto thee, O King, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Amen. That's a prayer. Amen. Father, we thank you this afternoon that you are our God. Thank you, Lord, that with real love in our hearts, we look at these officers, Father, and we pray for their souls. Lord, surely they feel your presence, and Lord, they know what is right and what is wrong. Now, Lord, help them be present, go home tonight. Help them to realize and never forget, and Lord, save their souls so that we can all go to heaven. And Lord, please forgive them for they know not what they're doing. That's what we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Please go ahead, officer. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is David Miller. Here's a mic. I'm a court enforcement officer, commonly known as a sheriff. I have a valid court order here today requiring the sheriff, that's me, and the assistance of the police to vacate everyone from the building and we will be locking the building. I'd ask for your respectful assistance in this and everyone leave please in an orderly fashion. This would be of great assistance to us. Obviously I know this is an upsetting circumstance that's come to rise. If you would please kindly all leave the building at this time. We would appreciate it. Thank you so much. There will be several court orders out in the exterior part of the church here for your perusal if you wish. There's a handful of orders we have. Thank, thank you, you, thank you, sir. Thank I appreciate your cooperation. Please start from the back and order the file out.
Well, here we are, walking out of the building. We have been told that they will be locking the building. Um, very, very sad day in Canada to see this actually happening. But uh, they're telling me that they have to do their job. So we will have to leave it at that at this point. But we know that God is in control. We know that God is uh, on his throne and that God knows exactly what is happening. We're looking to the Lord to help us as we faithfully serve him continually. Okay, so I'm gonna stop the video there. It goes for, for a little bit longer. Um, but how do you unpack that as a police officer? There's a few different things going on. Why are sheriffs involved? Why are court bailiffs involved? Uh, versus the police giving this court order? Um, does it have something to do with 176 of the criminal code? Because the police are assisting and not actually enforcing the order. So therefore they're not culpable or liable for breaking the law. How does this work? I'm not a cop. Play it out for me. Let's roll. Well, well first you gentlemen, all, mind if I jump in? <laughs> Sorry, Rob. I, just, I have to just because I was at the church right after this happened. I'm friends with the Hildebrand family. Um, while I was at the church after they closed them out of the church, Elmer police was surveilling me and Pastor Hildebrand and the family having lunch on picnic tables, watching from the bushes. They had a provincial task force surveilling us. Um, myself and Pastor Hildebrand and his family, 
for holding service and for encouraging officers to stand for their oath. What we saw there was a violation of Section 176 of the Criminal Code, which is very clearly outlined. I'm going to read it for everybody here because it's it's not even, you know, that there's anything to misinterpret. Section 176 of the Criminal Code says, everyone who by threats or force unlawfully obstructs or prevents or endeavors to obstruct or prevent a clergyman or minister from cele uh, celebrating divine service or performing any other function in connection with his calling or knowing that a clergyman or minister is about to perform, is on his way to perform or is returning from the performance of any of the duties or functions mentioned in paragraph A sub 1 assaults or offers any violence to him, et cetera, et cetera. The bottom line is this, he's holding service. And here we have a group of pacifists. We have a group of, of Mennonites. Their, their creed is to not be violent. And they are the most peaceful of us. Yeah. And the police came in and shut down their service because they wanted to serve their God and have their church open mm -hmm. to minister to those that were hurting through the most ridiculous time in our lifetime that was not backed by science and what they went through what that family was put through what what the courts did what the police did they arrested people they arrested two toronto police officers for attending that service also by the way i got the um, video here i was going to play it but i decided to play that one instead but yeah, uh, yeah i got that video as well from the parking lot yeah it's, it's, it's unreal it's, it's a violation of the human rights. It's a violation of the criminal code. It's a violation of common sense. It's a violation of everything that is what used to be good. But again, as it says in the Bible, I mean, we all know this, gentlemen, that we're under persecution, that we will eventually have to make a call for mm -hmm. our faith because it's, there's Muslim mosques open, synagogues yes. open. There was other places of worship open, and they were mm -hmm. not given any issue. But those that were serving God, Jesus, and, and, and professing their faith and holding service, they were persecuted. And that's only going mm -hmm. to get worse. So for those of you listening, if you're still hanging on with us, I know this is about the use of force. It's about the police. It's about all those things. But what it comes down to, and I'd be remiss if I didn't say this, it's about your faith. It's about your soul. It's about your salvation. Jesus Amen. is coming back. He is coming back. Whether it's in this lifetime or not, he is coming back. And there is a war on those that serve him. And it is worth dying for because your soul is worth standing up for. And it is worth taking a stand for your faith in Jesus Christ. And you will be attacked for it. You will be persecuted. As the early disciples were, so will, so will we. But to me, that doesn't scare me. And I don't think it scares anybody in this group of four and i'm hoping yep. those listening that you realize there's a reason why it doesn't scare us is because death has lost its sting wow that's uh yeah wow that's uh, well very well said very very well said um what a what a way to uh to to break down what happened there uh do you guys have anything else to add rob uh danny anything to put in there thank you chris so much well, for starters, God bless Pastor Henry Hildebrandt because uh, he was uh, a force for good in such terrible times. And he stood his ground and he did it peacefully. And this is why he, he maintains and enjoys so much credibility amongst the Christian community and why his, uh, his legacy was basically seen around the world, uh, just like Pastor Archer. Um, these, these, I mean, there's, I don't want to exclude anybody. There was a lot of pastors that suffered, but, uh, Correct. especially pastor Henry Hildebrandt, the, what he endured and how he went around it, having service outside the following Sunday. I mean, it just, he's just a wonderful man. Um, from a legal point of view, I don't, I don't actually think section 176 applies in this case. And I, I know I'll be the, the, the unpopular person for saying that, but the reason I don't believe it does in this case is because how the police approached and what they did. And what they did was they they entered into a part of the church where they didn't actually walk in during the service and put their hands up and try to shut it down, which is what 176 uh, um, is about. What they did was they waited in the back. They, they didn't interrupt the service. Pastor Henry put up his hand, held them back, and they didn't, they didn't disobey. Then he waved them into the service. So they entered on his <clears throat> on his on his signal. That's when they entered the actual service. I don't agree with what they did. Don't get me wrong. I, I think it's ridiculous. But in terms of what the force and effect of 176 is, 
just by virtue of being invited into the church and, and, and Pastor Henry, I guess he knew what was happening. I think he knew it was coming. Uh, they had the filming outside showing the police uh, coming in, but ultimately they didn't just enter the service and shut it down in the middle of the service. The service had a, the, the song was sang, scripture was read, and then he invited the, the officers to do their thing. I think they should be ashamed personally. Um, but in terms of 176, I, I don't think that in this case, uh, it was violated for those reasons. Okay. Danny, anything to add? Well, I think you said that you, they should be ashamed. And I think when you you could hear it in that sheriff's voice, the man who spoke on the microphone, like he obviously did not want to be there. And, you know, I would say tough than you shouldn't have been. But at the same time, typically when there's a court order like that, that I think they they feel like they're compelled to because like if there, if there if there's a warrant for someone's arrest for example, the wording is that they're the police are compelled to locate and apprehend the person, and so there is like an element of I would almost almost coercion there where like okay. where the the sheriffs are going to feel like their hands are tied and they probably called the police just to be there to make sure like the to keep the peace and because of the, just because of the nature of the size of the crowd, not because of the behavior of the people, but the size of the crowd. Um, but I ultimately, I can't defend it because I would have, I would have been happy to take my lumps and refuse that assignment. You know, you know what, you want to suspend me? Fine. You want to write me up? Fine. I'm not going. That, that would have been my approach. If, if I can play uh, the other side of the coin to Rob quickly, <laughs> and that would be this. You have seven days of the week. You have 24 hours of the day. You chose the Sunday at 10 a.m. while you know they hear, hold service with a church congregation of pacifists, knowing that they will obey judges and they will not stand in opposition to the law they will obey because they will not fight. <clears throat> and they chose that time to come and execute that closure. They could have done it at nine before the congregants showed up. They could have done it 11 after 1130 after they left. They chose to interrupt service. That was, a, that was an intentional timing of their part. And if I were their attorney, which I at times feel like maybe I should go to law school because stuff like this just irritates me so much. I would want to take on the fight like this. It bothers me because it's indefensible. You could have done it at any other time. You're telling me seven times 24, there was no, no other time prior to or thereafter, but you chose that. You interrupted service. You intentionally interrupted. Therefore, 176, in my view, would apply. Yeah, I, I, can, I can certainly see that point of view. Um, the, the one thing I don't have is what time it took place. I know they obviously entered on a day that service was being held. But were they willing to wait until the end of service? It's possible. I don't know. Um, but the, the fact does remain that Pastor Henry did invite them in and allowed them to, to affect, their, affect their warrant. So was 176 violated? I think there's two things at play, and I think I should clarify it. I don't agree that the church was shut down, obviously. I think it's ridiculous. I think it's gross. I think it's demonic, actually, that this happened. But with the strength and the force of 176, did they violate that to the law? I'm, I'm honestly, I'm not so sure that they did because they were invited in. And, and, that's, and that, that's the crux of it. Nothing else. Had they gone in during service while the singing was going on, while the, um, while the prayers were being read, completely different story, which is what happened to Pastor Arthur in, uh, in, in, out in the West. They were completely out of their element there. They were completely criminally responsible for their behavior there. No doubt about it. In this case, I think there's a bit of a gray area. But not, notwithstanding that part about 176, the fact that they did this, the fact that, they, like Chris said, they attacked Christianity. They let all the other religions go ahead and continue. It was Christianity that was sing, single, singled out, and it was attacked. Obviously, the chorts that are responsible for this fear Jesus. They fear God. And that's where you're going to find them in a church. So with the upcoming uh, legislation that they're trying to push through, I think it's uh, C is 372, the, um, the uh, 
pro- pro- prohibition or possible prohibition on reading scripture in public. I think that's a uh, that's coming down the pipe, and uh, the hate speech bill, uh, which seems like it's going to be a catch-all, um, which um, reading the gospel could fit perfectly into um, offending members of the rainbow LGBTQ community. Um, and how do we see if this comes into law? Would that supersede something like 176? Now we have an active pastor who is giving service. Um, however, they feel like his live uh, presentation that the uh, that of the service is offensive to uh, to somebody, and they come in to arrest him for hate speech. Um, him, um, sorry, they come in to arrest him for hate speech. Does that supersede? 176 are they still allowed to come in well what what are your thoughts on that i know it's all hypothetical but what do you think well i think in the interest of the show with it being you wanted to target an hour we're over two yeah yeah, yeah, Um, Yeah. so i'm I'm not going to go too long on this other than just to say that um this is all geared towards shutting it down this is just like china this is just like all the other places where they first usher in socialism then communism and the next thing you know you're not allowed to have religious freedom um it's it's not going to get better so to say this in short canada if you care at all about having freedom of expression and religion and belief and everything else you'll wake up and start pushing back because if not we're going to be china in very short order all right well in order for democracy to work people have to have to participate And I think that's one of the things that has been lacking, like Chris said at the very beginning of this podcast, is there have not been a lot of people participating. And that's part, that's a great reason why we are where we are. And I think the other aspect is, is people have not been cracking open their Bibles and reading it. And therefore they're allowing evil to fill the void in their lives of unhappiness because people are unhappy and they're turning to things and they're turning to the flesh and they're turning into sin. Uh, to to fill that void of unhappiness because they are ignoring what is in the Bible and what God's word is. With with regards uh, to your two questions, um, Tim, number one, the Charter makes it clear, and the Bill of Rights makes it clear that there is religious freedom. And any position that we take against the multicolor mob or the multigender mob, these are contained in our religion. They are the basis and the principles of the foundation of Western democracy. Leviticus clearly states what forbidden sexual practices are. It's right in the Bible. And these are our these are our religious beliefs, a well-established religious belief. It's there. And number two, so so I don't so I, I see it being I see it failing on a charter challenge, is where I'm going with this. I think a charter challenge would yeah. certainly uh render that that law of no force and effect. And I think the second law about um the hate speech and what is defined as hate speech, the the kind of catch-all, I think that is so broad that once again, it'll fall apart. I don't think any any uh, decent court or any decent judge would allow such a broad um, broad law to 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 be able to to continue. And once again, it should be it, I expect it to be struck down with no force or effect. Barring what we said at the beginning, that there is an activist Supreme Court and they're bringing, you know, concepts that aren't even raised in law and they're bringing them to the forefront. I think that's dangerous for sure. But at the end of the day, like Chris said, or Dan said, whoever said it, we are Christians. We expect that we are going to be uh, persecuted, but we all know how the how it all ends and we win in the end. So, Absolutely. Amen. Danny, final word. Well, a lot of people like to make claims that Christians hate people because of their sexual orientation and their gender identity expression. And that's not true at all. Like just because we don't believe what you believe doesn't mean that we hate you. So I think that that's that's the clearest message. Like Jesus teaches people to love their neighbor and to pray for your enemies. Like, Like, I'm sorry, there's no hate there. So absolutely. Yeah. You know, I think that's all I can really add of value. I mean, these Chris and Rob already covered the bases. Yeah. I would just say like when people throw that at you, you just say, no, like Jesus taught me to love everyone. And so that's what I'm trying to do. I don't have to agree with you and I don't have to go along with everything that you say. That doesn't mean I hate you. That's all I have to add. All right. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much. I know we ran quite a bit over time. 
Uh, I didn't anticipate that. And me and Chris talked earlier uh, before we started. Um, but do you, you want to wrap it up? Let's go to you, Chris. Wrap it up and maybe we'll close it out with a prayer. Does that sound good? Yeah, that sounds amazing. And I just want to first apologize to everyone listening for my unsavory words. When I get heated, I shouldn't be using the swear words that I do. And I just, I'm battling it daily, just like everybody. But as God says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And I'm so grateful for that. He is my salvation. And for everyone listening, if you can, please, like he loves you and it, the the fa- the fallacies of man and the fall of man is not the example of him. We all fall short. Read the word, find a Bible-centered church. And I'm telling you right now, this is all but a test and where we're going afterwards is what matters. So I just want to say thank you, everyone, for for you know listening to me ramble on and I'm grateful for the opportunity to, to pray. So if uh, everyone can, I just, I'm grateful for that. So dear Lord, thank you so much for these men. Thank you so much for men and women that are standing boldly in faith, like the Hildebrand family, like the Pawlowski family, like so many others that love you, honor you, serve you. We all fall short of your glory, God. We all do. That is why you sent your son to die on the cross for our sin. And just like Jesus with the woman at the well, just like Jesus who has drawn the line in the sand and said, ye who are free of sin, cast the first stone. We don't come to people with judgment and condemnation. We come as your hands and feet to try to spread the goodness of your gospel message, trying to bring people to you into the kingdom, Lord God, up against the principalities of darkness so that their souls will prevail against the attacks of the enemy. We want, Lord God, for you to use us in a mighty and powerful way. We know that we are forgiven for our sins and we repent of them daily. We are not perfect, but Lord God, we were made perfect in you. You love us. You care for us. We are redeemed through the blood that you shed on the cross for our sins. And I'm so grateful for that fact. I'm so grateful for the community that you have provided for us in finding each other, to have these discussions, to call out evil, and to be a witness for you, to bring people as your hands and feet, as I mentioned, into the kingdom. I pray that you'll bless these men that I'm here with today. I pray that you'll bless those that are listening to this message. I pray that people will fall on their knees and find you, Lord God, in the face of the evils that we're facing every day. Protect us, guide us, direct us. And Lord Jesus, I just pray that you will use us every day. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Beautiful prayer, Chris. Amen. Beautiful prayer. Very, very, very nice. Very beautiful. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much. That's all we have for tonight. Let me put my hat back on here. That's all we have for tonight. And again, thank you very much for joining me. This was my first time going live. And uh, I would love to uh, possibly do something like this again. Um, it's, it's good having these discussions. And, uh, and again, I thank you so much. Uh, and I guess that's it. I guess we're going to, uh, we'll call it up. I'm going to wrap it up after this, but uh, go check out. If you guys aren't aware of veterans for freedom, I think everybody here is this podcast is going to be part of uh, veterans for freedom and veterans TV. We're going to be having uh, multiple podcasts that are going to be running uh, the plan is to have it almost something like a 24 hour type of situation where you're always going to be able to get some feed. Um, so yeah, so keep, keep a look out for that and, uh, and go check out veterans for freedom. I know Chris, people can come to your store, check you out, uh, straight goods, clothing, um, straight goods. Some- com. Yeah, there you go. Straight goods.com. I'll, I had it up here running before. So thank you again, guys, very much for coming out and, uh, and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll chat to you soon. Awesome. Thanks, man. God bless you guys. You. Yeah, God, God bless, you. Gents. Thank Love you very you. much. God bless you. God bless. All right. Well, thank you everybody who tuned in for tonight. Again, this is my first live. It was my first kick at the can. And I want to just give a shout out to a few people. Um, number one would be Mr. Chris Dacey, Dacey Media. Uh, Chris is a local legend here in the Ottawa area. Uh, he is a downtown regular and he's capturing some great uh, footage of some of the corruption that is happening. So thank you very much, Mr. Dacey. I'm definitely going to be interested in having you on the show. I know we talked about it earlier. Um, so let's see if we can make that happen. Also, I just want to roll a clip. I was saying we are part of Veterans for Freedom. Interrogative is a podcast on Veterans for Freedom. You can go check out uh, the podcast. There's multiple other podcasts of, uh, of veterans who are doing this. Uh, a couple of great podcasts that are out there. And I just want to roll a few ads for Veterans for Freedom. So you can check out our merchandise store. There's a lot of great stuff going on right now. And I'm going to roll the clip. So 
So if you can help support Veterans for Freedom, uh, it's a group of men and women who are out there doing great things uh, for the community, sticking up for freedom. Um, we help out where we can and uh, go check out the merch store. Thank you very much, everybody, for tuning in tonight. I hope you enjoyed that discussion. I think it was very uh, bountiful in its uh, in its reach. And uh, I hope you come and join me again on Interrogative Podcast. You can check me out on YouTube and Rumble, Interrogative Podcast. Again, I'm your host, Tim Wall. Stay safe. Stay free. Have a good night.